Hello everyone, and welcome to week two of Criminology. Today we'll be doing the uh, lecture based upon Criminology, third edition, chapter two, by Frank Smaliger, copyright 2016, uh, Pearson Education, Inc. So last week, as you recall, and if you haven't seen it or you weren't in class, you can review last week's lecture. It is posted online right above where this one was, if you found it. But last week, we introduced you to criminology, what the term criminology means, the study of crime and criminals. You know, look, we're looking for causes. We talked a little bit about research and theories and how criminologists arrive at their uh, ideas. You know, how do you make, take a hypothesis, which says, I think, well, A is happening, and B is happening, and I think that's causing C. Or A is going up and B is going up, and one of them, I think, causes the other. Uh, how they do scientific analysis and, and figure those things out. And we also talked about the, three, the two major measures of crime, actually three, depending on who presents it to you. One would be the Uniform Crime Reports, and the other is the National Crime Victimization Survey. Uh, the third is called NIBRS, which is a national incident-based reporting system, which, which is kind of an offshoot of the Uniform Crime Reports, which is why I tend to call it, call them two. Matter of fact, in a Department of Justice, Bureau of Justice Statistics report in September of 2014, they entitled it the nation's two crime measures, but did talk about NIBRS. NIBRS has been around since the not late 90s, and uh, so therefore, I call it two because basically it's part of the UCR, it's an enhancement UCR, makes the UCR better. And those two things are very important in that it's part of where we get the information that we need to try to figure out what's going on. You know, people look at, well, Chicago, 900 murders. Well, how come? What was it the year before? What was it the year before that? What else changed? Because obviously you can't just look at those numbers and say, wow, you start, criminologists are gonna look at well, what else is going on in Chicago that might be leading to this? Is it the poverty? Is it the way the police are reacting to crime or not reacting to crime or being not being aggressive enough in dealing with, with folks? Is it the fact that the, the economy might be bad in Chicago? You know, there's a whole host of reasons why crime could be going on. Is it an epidemic of gangs that hasn't been properly dealt with along the line? Is it the fact that budget constraints have reduced the size of the Chicago Police Department? What is it? Criminologists are gonna try to ana analyze that. So they're looking at a variety of different things and we talked about all that last week. So if you wanna see it, I don't, I don't wanna go too far into it but you can go look at, at last week's lecture for that. That's what you'd be looking for. Chap that's chapter one. And that's in the, either the third edition or second edition of this textbook, whichever one that you happen to have. Uh, they're identical, pretty much identical. There might be some more recent information, maybe some more recent stories, but the basic premises in, in both books are the same in chapter one. And the same in chapter two, which we're gonna look at today. Uh, it's called Classical and Neolo ne Neoclassical Criminology, Choices and Consequences. Of course, that's me. Objectives of this chapter is we want to outline principles of classical and neoclassical criminology. We want to outline the history of classical thought, a development of neoclassical criminology, describe how neoclassicism views punishment as a deterrent to crime, outline arguments for and against the death penalty, explain how classical ideas or school affects policy, and keep in mind that our current criminal justice system is pretty much based mostly on classical thought. The classical and neoclassical are, are very similar, and the reason there's two is because classical was back in the 1700s, and then it kind of lost favor due to something called positivism, which we will also talk about, and then neoclassicism was when the classical ideas were revived in the 1970s, believe it or not, after years of, of other types of things going on. So we're going to summarize evaluations of classical and neoclassical theories. So those are the basic objectives, and they are, of course, 
in the front of the chapter, the, the, uh, the objectives are listed. So classical and neoclassical chronology, what's it all about? Well, first of all, you had something go on in the, in the 17th century called the Enlightenment, where people started getting more ideas of rational thought and the application of scientific principles. Now, to, to compare to what, well, why is it different? There was rash, now there's rational thought. You know, what's going on? And uh, of course, I neglected to share the screen for you. Let's look at that so you don't have to look at me. All right, so this is where we are. At the PowerPoint, if you want to see what was on the other slides, basically, I just read the objectives that are in the textbook. And uh, there was a, a slide with my name on it and of course the title slide. But you have access to these PowerPoints in the course, go to the doc sharing, go to the section that's labeled PowerPoints and just download it. And it might actually be a good idea if you were to stop right now, if you don't already have it and bring it up in front of you or print it out or whatever. Uh, and word to the wise, don't print full screen slides because it's 63 pages, 65 pages, whatever. What I usually do when I give them in class is I print six on a page. And unless, of course, you have some reading issues that you can't see the print that small, I would definitely uh, print it in six to a page. So you can follow along, or you can do three to a page, and they have little note sections if you like to take notes. And whatever works for you, I would suggest, you know, if you, some of you should be taking notes while you're watching the video, uh, it's very important. So classical criminology basically came out of this time of what's called the Enlightenment, where people started thinking of things rationally. And the, the difference is, prior to the Enlightenment, there was a lot of, of, well, it came from the heavens. You know, it came from God. It came from demons in the brain. And this particular textbook doesn't get into some of those things, but there was actually, and it may be in the next chapter, in biological thought, but there was something where they used to think people were, were sick in the head, basically. They had demons in the brain, and they used to cut holes in the brain to let out, let out the evil spirits. It was called trephination. So prior to the, the Enlightenment, you, didn't ha you had a lot of, like, you know, the boogeyman, the demons, God. Of course, many of us believe in God, but do we feel that God has a hand in everything that we do every day? Some people maybe. I think the majority of the citizens feel that God is involved, but not necessarily deciding what I'm going to do all day long. Uh, but back then, it might have been what it is. So that enlightenment, that feeling, the idea of rational thought led to this classical school of criminological thought, which, uh, let's make sure I didn't skip too far, right? So crime and deviance came to be understood as products of the exercise of free will. In other words, somebody decided to do it. That's what free will is. You'll hear about free will in classical and uh, neoclassical. That's one of the most important premises of classical criminology. And think about our criminal justice system today. Why do we punish people? We punish people based upon the fact that they made a decision. When we do uh, pretrial or pre-sentencing investigations. We look at the person and we try to figure out why they made their decision. But primarily, you know, you're still looking at they made a decision. Even how we classify crimes. In, in New Jersey, it's first, second, third, fourth degree crimes. Other states, you know, felonies, misdemeanors. But different levels of crime and different levels of punishment are based upon what level of, of decision making. You know, uh, uh, murder one is based upon someone knowingly, knowingly and willingly committing that murder, that homicide. And the lower levels are, are lesser involvement in the decision-making process. But our whole system, the fact that we punish people, is based upon, upon this. And we'll see the reason for that is mainly because in the 70s with the neoclassical uh, coming in and revival of classical ideas, that's why we have our system today. All right, so what's the history? Classical ideas, again, come out of the Enlightenment, 
he had a guy named Cesar Beccaria, or some people say Beccaria, and he wrote this document, published Essays on Crimes and Punishment. Uh, interesting document if you want to read it. Obviously, well, obviously, yeah, but he's an Italian guy. And it was actually written originally in Italian, but it has been translated into English many, many years ago. It's available. I got it through Amazon on my Kindle. It might have been free. I'm not positive. But it's a neat read. It's really long. We're just going to break it down in, into its, distill it into its most uh, important pieces. So Bakaria, he was also, his, his name was really Cesar Bonasana, who had a title called the Marques, Marquese de Bakaria. So that's, a, and somehow his name becomes Cesar Bakaria for historical, uh, from a historical perspective. So Bakaria claimed that punishment should be based upon the degree of injury caused by the offender. So however bad the person was and what they did to somebody, the punishment should be similar. And you've probably heard the term, the punishment fits the crime. Well, that's kind of where this idea came from. The punishment fits the crime. Bakaria said degree of injury caused by the offender, that's what you should base the punishment on. He said the purpose of punishment should be deterrence rather than retribution. What that means is the idea of punishment should be to prevent people from committing crimes. So we should basically scare people in to, to not committing crimes. Again, our system today for a lot of that is based upon that. Why do we have in some states automatic three years if you commit a crime with a gun? Because the idea is, well, oh man, I better not use a gun when I rob the 7-Eleven because I'm going to get an extra three years on top of whatever the sentence is for the robbery. That's how our system is based on this idea that deterrence, we want to deter crimes. Later on, we talk about the death penalty. We're going to be talking about specific uh, versus general deterrence. General deterrence being that when we see that Johnny Jones got locked up and went to prison right away, maybe we think, oh, I don't want to do that. Specific is Johnny Jones, when he gets out of prison, doesn't want to go back. So that's the, and it's an important concept to understand, general versus specific deterrence. Bakari believed deterrence was the important thing, not retribution. Retribution means payback. We'll see that, that in the neoclassical era, that kind of changed a little bit. Uh, but we want to prevent people from committing new crimes. Another very important concept of classical thought, that punishment should be swift, it should be certain, and it should be severe. Now, what does that mean? Swift means it should happen right away. It explains it in detail in your book, but it basically means that when the crime occurs, the person should be apprehended. They should be tried. It should all be done quickly. People who commit crimes should know they're going to get caught and tried. That's the certain part. And severe just means that that punishment should be harsh enough to create that de deterrence. In other words, Fits the crime, just harsh enough that, you know what, it costs me more to, to commit the crime than, than it does not to, so maybe I won't do it. Swift, certain, and severe. Look at our system today. Do we fit? Most people would probably say no. If you have a person who's sitting in crammed full, from hold uh, prison on State Road in Philadelphia awaiting trial on a minor offense for like a year and a half, that is not swift by any means. And we'll see later on, there's a funnel in your text, and it comes up on the slides, that it's also not certain because the vast majority, I always hated that term, but the vast majority, you'll see, do not even get caught, let alone get punished. And we'll see those numbers are staggering when you look, when you look at them. Jeremy Bentham, concurrent with... with uh, with Beccaria, actually he was 10 years younger, but he was, he was writing during the same time. His book was called Principles of Morals and Legislation. And he argued that the pain associated with crime commission must outweigh the pleasure derived from criminal activity. So that's like the, the weighing of the pleasure versus pain. So, you know, if it's gonna really, really hurt me to commit this crime, maybe I don't wanna do it. If I'm gonna get a lot of pleasure out of it and I can withstand a little pain, I'll do it. And 
It's also, he called it the hedonistic principles or hedonistic concept and utilitarianism, which is actually on the next slide. He also believed that people were fundamentally rational. It means that people thought about things. People made decisions. Now, one of the things we're gonna see, uh, and there's a lot of talk about that today, is that even though these guys believed that people were rational, and even today, society, our criminal justice system, assumes that people make decisions, we're gonna find that psychologically, or because of whatever motivations are going on, or because of alcohol or drugs or something else, that people's ability to process the information and decision-making process is not always the same. So even though these guys, the classical thought, said everybody's rational and people make decisions, but think about you know, the guy who is sober and decides, goes through the process, I need some money because of, you know, I can't pay my mortgage and I rob the store, versus the guy who's drunk out of his mind and makes the same decision. Do you think they actually both went through the same thought process? What's the other thing that, that comes out in, in current, you know, review of, of these theories is that a lot of people that are in our prison systems today didn't put a heck of a lot of thought into whether they were going to commit the crime or not. So even though people have rational, make rational decisions, some of them are split second decisions. Some of them, you know, how many people when they're going to rob a 7-Eleven or they're going to rob somebody in the street, think about whether they're going to get life in prison if they accidentally kill the person or they're going to get the death penalty. You know, think about the guys who were involved in the killing of police officer Moses Walker, who all they saw was this, this 40 year old, you know, kind of small guy walking down the street and they decided to rob him and they wound up killing him. You know, they thought they were just going to do a street robbery, get a few bucks off the guy and be on their way. And now they're both in prison, right? Both in prison. Now, whether I, I forget whether the one guy got the death penalty or not, but since Pennsylvania has got a moratorium on a death penalty, that's kind of irrelevant anyway at this point. And you also have, uh, potentially a new DA in Philadelphia if the Democrat candidate wins, who has already professed that he's not going to use the death penalty at all in the city. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, so Bentham, as again said, hedonistic calculus is what it was called, or utilitarianism, basically pleasure versus pain. People have value to what they're going to do, and they weigh it as to What's it going to be? It's going to, it's going to hurt me. It's going to help me. Which is which has more value to me? All right. Bentham also created something called or an idea. He designed something called a panopticon. That was a a prison. I would Google the term panopticon, look at images, so you can see what it actually looks like. In class, I drew it up on a board. I don't have a whiteboard here in in my home office. But basically, it was a circular facility where, where the, the cells were all facing the center. And then you had an observation point or maybe a little tower where the, the, the guards or corrections officers would be in. And from that central area, they could see inside every single cell and they could tell whether the prisoners were there or not. There were three, I believe, three of those prisons built in the United States. Uh, a few more built in Europe. Some of our prisons ha are, have similar structures, but are, are not exactly the same. If you ever go on a tour of, of uh, the Philadelphia prison system, specifically CFCF, and you go into some of their pods, you have a centrally located tower, and then there's pods that can be seen from each tower. So you can see uh, activity outside of the cells, you can't necessarily see into every cell, especially since some of the cells in some of the areas have solid doors with little windows in them. So from the, but they can see what's going on outside. So if, if the inmates are, are out in a common area where in some of these places in, in the uh, Philadelphia prison system, they actually have common areas out right outside the cells where they have like picnic benches kind of thing. They're metal when they're bolted to the floor, but they can sit around, they can play cards, they can whatever. And the officers are actually right there with them. So the person in the control room, 
who is secure within their room and the pod is secure, they can see what's going on. So if all of a sudden the inmates get out of control and start attacking the officers, those people can see it. And of course there's cameras everywhere too. But the Panopticon, there was three, three bill, take a look, interesting, interesting idea. Bentham was responsible for that. All right. And of course, what's also mentioned on that slide is, is he thought that maybe the Panopticon would have a deterrent effect because if you built them in or near cities and the people within the cities would see this facility, maybe they wouldn't want to go into them. And maybe an example would be Eastern State Penitentiary, which is located up in the Fairmount section. It's closed, closed in 1972 after being around for like 150, 200 years. I forget exactly when it opened, but it changed a lot over the years. It's not actually a panopticon, but you have a central, there is also a central area, and then you have the different cell blocks, hallways, that are visible. So you can see the hallway, but you can't see inside the cells because the cells face into the hallways. But that was built, when it was built, it wasn't really, the area wasn't heavily populated, but it was built just north of, of Center City and Old City areas in Philadelphia. So it was certainly visible, this monstrosity or castle looking structure, you know, just up the street from where the folks lived would be like a really like, whoa, I don't want to go there. So that was one of Bentham's ideas as well, is if you had, had these facilities within, within the city or with, within view of the citizens that maybe it would also have a uh, deterrent effect. Of course, today we do the exact opposite. People don't like prisons in their neighborhoods, so prisons are usually built out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, example, uh, in New Jersey, there was a place called Riverfront Prison. It had some prime real estate on the Delaware Riverfront in, in Camden, New Jersey. It was torn down uh, five to 10 years ago because people didn't want to have a prison right in the middle of town. So then, of course, New Jersey built and other facilities somewhere else. You know, find some, find some real estate where there's not a lot of people in houses around and build your prison there. So, the exact opposite. And even with the death penalty, we'll talk about it later. You know, they used to do the hangings in the public square. You watch any of these Western movies and they hang somebody. It was an event. People would come out and watch the people get hung. They did it all over the world. Uh, the guillotine in France, you know, it was out in public. We're now, are, uh, when they do the death penalty, you get the lethal injection, you got witnesses, maybe somebody from the press, the lawyers, family members, whatever, but you know you don't air it on TV. Way back when, that was an idea of, of how to prevent crime, how to deter people was to let them see it. Today, no. Is that why we have more crime? I don't know. Interesting thought though. What do you think? All right, neoclassical. Now, before we actually explain neoclassical in this, this short set of slides, is to talk a little bit about what happened between classical and neoclassical. So, after classical uh, criminology was around for a while, there was an emergence of something called positivism. And positivism was based on an idea called hard determinism, which was a belief that people behaved and committed crimes because of things that were beyond their control. There's something biological, psychological, something going on within the person that they didn't make a decision. So positivism was all about the people didn't, the person didn't make a decision to commit a crime. Something was going on. There was some kind of, of very strong motivation that caused them to, to commit the crime. And so you have the idea of, of hard determinism and, and soft determinism and uh, then free will. So hard determinism suggested that all offenders were not responsible for their crime, suggested that crime could be prevented by changing the conditions that produced the criminality. So what that came, what happened out of that is you had years and years of scientific research. They did push you know, doing proper scientific research, which we still do today but it was really pointed towards what's wrong with 
the individual in their makeup and maybe even get moving up into the era where we start looking at, at social problems as issues that, that caused crime. And what can we change? It's not about the person's free will. It's what, what's going on that we can change. How can we treat them? How can we uh, provide them with rehabilitation programs in the prison system? You know, what is wrong? Is it they got a poor education and they couldn't get a job so they commit crimes? So now we're going to educate them in the prison system. Is it because they had some kind of mental issue, we're going to give them a proper treatment? And that's what positivism was. And it still it exists. Keep in mind, you know, the slide deck in your book, you talk about, well, we had criminal, uh, classical criminology, then we had positivism, then we had neoclassical. But all those things overlapped. And also, there's still belief in some of, of the theories that carried over the years today. But now we're talking about integrated theory. So we're not looking at, say, well, it's just because of this biological issue. It's just because of the social problems. No, it might actually be a combination, right? Positivists might say that this person has a, di a biological uh, disposition to commit crime, and that's why they commit crime. But then how come other people that have very similar issues don't also commit crime? How come when we get into the social issues, and we're going to talk about social structure and social process later on in the course, if you have people growing up in the exact same environment, the exact same neighborhood, whether it be Philadelphia, Camden, Newark, or wherever it is where you have high crime rates, how do you explain the people that live in that same neighborhood, same age, that are not committing crimes? So that's where we get the integrated theories where we take, okay, maybe this person might have some kind of predisposition and coupled with the neighborhood cause them to commit crimes. We'll get into some of that much later on in the course, but uh, we have to make the connection. How did we get from classical to neoclassical? All right, this, is, this chart just gives you an idea of the uh, span from free will to hard determinism. So free will is basically saying everybody makes decisions and choices on their own. Hard determinism basically says no, you don't make decisions and choices on your own. Soft determinism could be like we look at integrated theories and say, okay, well, this person may have a brain tumor that led them to commit crimes and it made it harder for them to make the decision, but they still made a choice. And I'll be showing you a video in a couple of weeks about a guy who actually had a brain tumor. I think the book has a story about him in chapter five or six and talking about this guy who was starting to commit sex crimes and they found out he had a tumor. But he still made a choice. He still knew the difference between right and wrong, but the tumor impacted an area of his decision making and his inhibitions and whatnot, just like when you get drunk and you get your inhibitions are affected. This brain tumor impacted that area. So free will is everybody makes their own choices, no other input. Our determinism is there's something outside of the person that's causing or something uh, medically inside but not their decision. They have no control. Where soft determinism is more like, there could be a variety of different things. And if, if, if I didn't make sense with that, put a comment down and ask for a better explanation. Or read the section in the chapter and I, we can help you out there. All right, undermining of positivism came all the way up. Remember classical guy Bentham and Beccaria were in the 1700s. After many years of those kind of ideas, then you had uh, kind of an undermining of positivism because there were several studies that, that took place in the 1970s that suggested that offenders could not be rehabilitated. And this would call the, the, the nothing works philosophy, that here we have all these programs in our prison systems and these guys are still coming out and committing crimes. Rec recidivism is pretty high. Uh, doesn't matter what we do these people are still deciding to commit crimes. And again, that was called Nothing Works. Your book explains that idea as well. So we had widespread public fear of crime, get a tough on crime policies, uh, a, uh, a look back at classical ideas. And of course, when we started pulling these classical ideas back into criminology, 
it was called neoclassical. The term, the, the uh, N-E-O, neo usually means new. So very similar ideas, but now moving from the 1700s all the way up to the 1970s, they called it neoclassical. So neoclassical criminology focused on the importance of character, dynamics of character development, and rational choices that people make as they are faced with opportunities for crime. So you had a little bit of a, a change in that now we're looking at, at people, we're looking at the character that they have, we're looking at can we improve their character. You had, you know, some kind of training programs came out with character development programs and how we could do that so that we could impact people's choices. How can we impact the choices that they made? I think even if you look at some of the prevention programs that have been used throughout, whether it's, it's D.A.R.E., which I was highly involved in from like 1992 up to 2005, and a lot of other uh, programs out there is you look at decision making, you look at problem solving, and you help people to walk through that decision making process. So now we're not saying, neoclassical, we weren't just saying, okay, everybody makes a decision and there's no way to, there's no way to deal with it. No, we're also now looking at how can we help people make better decisions? And also, how can we control the different things that are going around so that they don't make those decisions? And we're going to look at that as well. So Martinson, he was the guy with the Nothing Works Doctrine. He looked at correctional treatment programs and said they were not successful. And he looked at a variety of programs. And interestingly enough, you go back and look at some of those programs, and then you look at what's going on in some facilities today, and you have a resurgence of some of those programs. Or, or some different types of programs. Because it, again, it's not just one thing. So we might find that people make decisions. We might have found that there was a lot of failure going on in the programs back in the 70s where people were not being uh, rehabilitated. But we also have to look at, get down into well, why weren't those programs being successful? Can, could those programs have been improved? Is there, are there other things that we should have done along with those programs, which is why if, when you start looking around our prison systems today, you're gonna to see programs, whether it's somebody trying to get their GED, somebody working in a, a shop within the prison system, learning how to do basic skills like carpentry, uh, which both go on in the Philadelphia prison system. They also have a, a, a dog training program where, where inmates train uh, rescue dogs. Uh, there's a lot of things going on. And if you have access, whether it be Netflix or Comcast or Verizon accounts, and you go to 60 Minutes, which is a news uh, magazine type of show, 60 Minutes on this past Sunday night, so that would have been May 22nd. I'm sorry, what's today, 24th? It's Wednesday, so 23rd, 21, May 20th. Go May 20th. And uh, no, 21st, I'm sorry. Uh, anyway, look for 60 Minutes this past Sunday. And they actually had two episodes. The episode from, from 8 o'clock to 9 o'clock, I believe, was uh, there was one section about the Cook County, Cook County Jail in Chicago and the, the new sheriff in Chicago and how he was instituting a whole lot of new programs within the prison system and how the warden, within the uh, Cook County Jail was not a corrections officer. She came from another background. Similar to when you look at the, at the Cran Fromhold prison in Philadelphia, the, uh, or actually the whole Philadelphia prison system, the current, the current commissioner of corrections in the city of Philadelphia actually came up as a social worker within the prison system. She was also not a corrections officer, which shows us that there is now more focus on providing more programming Hopefully that's based upon uh, studies that show that some of these things work, but we are kind of going back to, we need to have some programs. We need to provide these people uh, the ability to be successful in society when they get out. So again, these things go back and forth, but in the seventies, Martinson said none of it was working. James Q. Wilson, he published thinking about crime in 1975 and he basically said crime was not a result of poverty or social conditions. It cannot be affected by social programs. Now, keep in mind that during this time, 
and even up through the 80s, criminology is still very strongly at that time sociologically based, where people are looking at social prog programs, and we're going to talk about those uh, theories later on, social structure, the, how, the structure how the society is made up, social process, how the person in, interacts with society, and how that, that impacted their decision-making process and, and what they did. But in 1975, Wilson is saying, crime doesn't come from this. He's saying that poverty and social conditions do not cause crime, which means that no matter what you do to fix that, it's not gonna fix crime. Well, today you hear people saying otherwise. So again, this is like a fluid thing that changes back and forth. We find out new ideas. We figure out that maybe we need to tweak this here, tweak that there. Or you know, sometimes it might be that we're trying things because they sound good and we're not listening to the criminologists. Remember that, that problem that we talked about last week. So what, but what Wilson said is we should lock them up for a long time, lengthy incarceration, so that we don't have the ability for them to commit crime, which we're gonna talk about later, it's called incapacitation. You know, if you lock somebody up in a prison system, they're basically incapacitated. They, they, have, they have no ability to commit crime in the outside world because they're not out there. And that's what Wilson's basic philosophy was. Is, is lock them up. So that led to something called the justice model, where we basically gave people what they deserved. You committed a crime, you do the time. Now there was a, for you older students, you might remember the show Beretta and the song, the theme song was if, you know, if you can't do the, you can't do the time, don't do the crime. Well, that's the justice model, is you commit the crime, you're gonna get the punishment that you deserve. And they also called it just desserts. People deserve punishment because of the choices that they make. So we're going, we're, our system again, is still based upon this, this model that came originally from the classical school of, of criminology. And an example of that would be three strikes laws. Three strikes, in the states that have three strikes laws, you commit your third felony, you go to prison for life. And there were some issues with them in that sometimes people were going to prison for life for committing something relatively minor, and some felt that that was unfair. So this, the, uh, I think California was one of the places that, that rewrote their three strikes, so that third offense has to be something serious, and there was a list, a list of specific offenses, and that's in your book as well. But the justice model, people get what they deserve. This is just a, a, a flow chart, which, can be a little confusing, but it basically shows you, we have an offender, where did they come from? What's their socioeconomic background? What's their psychological background? How were they socialized? What lifestyle do they, do they live in? Uh, what people do they hang out with? What skills have they learned? Are they encouraged to commit crime? What opportunities do they have? Are they motivated by something? Uh, do, are there people out there that are potential victims, which we call unprotective co targets? Uh, do they then evaluate the pros and cons of committing a crime? They make an assessment or decision, and depending upon what that assessment or decision might be, they either commit the crime or they don't. Simple example, you have somebody who's motivated to commit crime, they grow up in, in a certain neighborhood where you know it's not that big a deal to rip people off, whatever. Some of you know exactly the, the kind of places that, that we're talking about. Where, where it's, you know, the lifestyle for some people is, is like that. So here this, and he, maybe he's guys hanging around with a small gang or whatever, uh, a group of folks who encourage that type of behavior. So now you're out and you see a, a male walking down the street and heading towards an ATM machine. It's, say, 1230, not a lot of traffic on the street, maybe there's nobody around, and you look at that, you're looking around, your decision is, hey, I think I'm gonna rob this guy. As you're walking up to them, you see a police officer out of the corner of your eye walking up the street, or you see the police car coming down the street. That changes your assessment, changes your decision, and it's like, okay, not, not right now. So, and that could be, certainly that's an immediate decision. I mean, you have to be absolutely a fool or absolutely nuts to, to go and then commit a robbery right in front of, of the police. But some people are pretty brazen, thinking they could pull off the robbery and then run down the street and get away. But your basic decision-making process, you look at the pros and cons and their assessment and their decision 
is it could be as simple as that. You know, they see the target. There's nobody protecting the target. They decide they're going to rob them. Then all of a sudden, the police are there to protect them, and I change my mind before I get revealed. So this developed into something called rational choice. Rational choice theory is has a lot of the principles in classical criminology. Rational choice theory suggests that criminals make conscious, rational, and at least partially informed choices to, make, to commit crimes. So we're still looking at that, that rational choice. Partially informed means that they have information. You know, they're not totally in the dark with regard to what the consequences might be, you know, might, might happen. But again, I, I still believe, and I know there's many people out there that agree with me, that, that a lot of people who commit crimes are not considering, well, I might get five years for this. When they're, when they're robbing a 7-Eleven and going in with a gun to rob the 7-Eleven, they're not thinking about, they're not really thinking about the consequences. They're more concerned about whether the cops around are going to get caught, but they're not thinking about the, the punishment. So, Basically, rational choice, it says when the benefits outweigh the costs, they're going to commit the crime. Very similar to Jeremy Bentham and his pleasure versus pain, right? So if the benefits outweigh the costs, if I'm going to get the money, and maybe if, I, if it's because of my drug habit and get the money, pay for my drugs, be okay, and do it again tomorrow, as long as it's not going to cost me too much. Now, an interesting example, years ago, uh, a partner and I were out in an unmarked car one day, and there was a shoplifting at a local Wawa store. And, of course, all the, the officers that were in that particular area streamed on in there, and somehow the guy slipped through the cracks. He got away. Uh, my partner and I had not been in that, that initial general area at first, but we kind of rolled on up there because the guy was still out there. We had a description of the guy. And we go driving down the street, and boom, there he is. And as soon as we pulled up to him, he basically threw himself on the back of the car, you know, hands on the, on, the, on the trunk and said, you got me. And talking to him later when we were taking him to the county jail after he had been processed at the police station and we had the charges, basically what he told us was that was the cost of doing, getting arrested was the cost of doing business in his life. So he made a rational choice, the benefits versus the cost. He had a drug habit. He would go into these local stores in the suburban communities. You know, maybe he'd take the bus to get up there or somebody drop him off. Uh, he was actually living in Camden. He would go up to these stores. He would, would steal over-the-counter medications, you know, maybe your, your Advil or your Aleve or something like that, that back in those days weren't locked behind a cabinet as they are in a lot of places now. And then he would get the bus ride back to Camden. He would sell his stuff to some local bodega or little store on the streets of Camden. And then he'd take that money and go buy his hit for the day. And then he would, you know, be off being whatever you do when you're high as a kite, sleep, maybe grab something, eat somewhere, do, you know, basic functions. He didn't have a job or anything, but that, his lifestyle was steal, go get your drugs. Next day, he's doing the same, he's going out and doing the same thing. So to him, getting locked up. Going into the, the uh, county jail and maybe getting three square meals and a nice bed to sleep on, or not necessarily a nice bed, but probably better than, better than what he had, is okay. That was part of his decision-making because his, his rap sheet, his uh, criminal history, was really, really long. It was like multiple pages. Multiple times over the past several months, he had been locked up. And again, that was okay. That was his choice. So there's two varieties of rational choice theory. One is, is routine activities theory, and the other one is called situational choice theory. So routine activities theory, if you go back to that, that big flow chart, one of the things that they talked about was an unprotected person. All right, well, routine activities theory takes that a little bit and formalizes a little bit. Uh, surprisingly, you, know, you have the... the that flow chart is on page 27 in, in the third edition of the textbook, but they don't have another one. If you, do, if you draw a triangle and you put motivated offender on one leg of the triangle, suitable target on another leg of the triangle, and lack of capable guardian at the base of the triangle, and you can write crime in the middle, 
because routine activities theory basically said that if you had these strings, these three things occurring at the same time, then you had crime. So the motivated offender is that guy who maybe needs the money for, for his drugs, need the money for his mortgage, whatever it is. Suitable target, poor guy walking down the street, going to the ATM, or maybe as Officer Moses Walker, you know, little guy walking down the street, looks like, looks like he's unprotected. They didn't know because he was in plain clothes that he was actually a cop and he was armed. So, and they didn't see a capable guardian, even though he was a police officer. So lack of capable guardian is, you know, what's there that might protect the person? Is there a police officer standing outside the bank that you don't want to go rob it? Is there, you know, a police car walk, driving down the street while you're going to break into the house or you're going to break into a car or you're going to rob somebody on the street? If they're not there, that's the lack of capable guardian. So you take these three things, that person who's motivated to commit a crime, the target that's unprotected, and, of course, the fact that there's no gate, nobody there to protect them. And that could be that the house in the neighborhood, the one house in the neighborhood that, has, that doesn't bother to lock their door or doesn't have a burglar alarm. It could be the person walking down the street. There's a lot of different, different things that you could look at. But that's routine activities theory. Basically, very simple. The crime prevention technique that comes out of routine activities theory is eliminate one of those things. So which one's the easiest to eliminate? Well, can we take all the motivated offenders off the street? Well, that's what some people's theory is. You lock them up forever and you don't have them out there. Can we eliminate suitable targets? Well, we're in a free society. People are always walking around. But if we provide more information about crime prevention and teach people how to protect themselves or you know, how to be alert when you're out on the street alone, maybe we have less suitable targets. And of course, capable guardian, whether it's, Police presence in areas where we're more likely to see the crimes. Of course, you can't have a cop on every corner, so it's tough to do that. But maybe now we have cameras everywhere. That's an addition to the eyes and ears for our capable guardians. Uh, people have alarm systems. People carry portable alarms that they, you know, you pull a, you, you pull something and it creates a screaming alarm that scares somebody. There's a lot of things that could fit into that category. So, under routine activities theory to prevent crime is to take away one of these things. Situational, situational choice theory is, we say criminal behavior is a function of the choices and decisions made within the situation. You know, what's the, con, the, uh, the constraints of the situation? Uh, am I in going into the 7-Eleven where there's three employees and it's always crowded? or I should say the Wawa. Wawa is more likely to have a bunch of employees and be crowded as opposed to the 7-Eleven. It's been around for, for 30 years and the business is poor and there's like hardly anybody there and they only have one buddy and one person in there. Look at those two different choices. Which place is more likely to get robbed? Probably the 7-Eleven because there's less risk. So situational choice is you think about the various situations. Obviously, there's similarities between routine activities and situational choice that we can see. And routine activities, there's also, you can uh, talk about another theory that's called lifestyle theory, which we'll talk about later on in the course. You know, what does the person do on a daily basis that might put them at risk or put them in contact with the motivated offender? So if their lifestyles evolve around each other, look at, uh, if you look up the case of the Kensington Strangler a few years back, wound up being a serial killer because he actually wound up killing three, three separate women in the Kensington area. But those, those women, and not, the, not belittling those, those unfortunate deceased ladies, but drug addicts and prostitutes, they were out on the street either looking for drugs or looking for someone to pay them for sex. So their guard is down. The guy walks up and says, hey, hon, you want to go back, you know, want to go in the alley, and, you know, and I'll give you that 20 bucks for whatever. And she's willing to go, and then he strangles her and kills her. Routine activities, what they were doing, their lifestyle, put them in that risky situation. And it could happen to anybody. You know, if you work, you work a job where you're, you're getting off of work at midnight, and you're taking the bus to get to your, your house in North or West Philly, and you're walking down the street at 1 o'clock in the morning, you know, there's a possibility that you could be the victim based upon your lifestyle, your, your uh, routine activities, if you will.
take the example of the, the young lady that was kidnapped off the street in Philly a couple of years ago. I forget whether it's Germantown or which part of the city it was, but she got off a bus. She's walking down the street to, to go home, and some guy pulls up in a car, yanks her into the car. She leaves her cell phone behind, uh, which obviously let people know that, that she was taken off the street, and they were able to look at the cameras and find out. And there was a great investigation that took place, Philadelphia police, federal agencies, and they, they found her and rescued her down in, in uh, Maryland, I believe it was. But that was lifestyle or routine activities that she got off of work and she's walking home late at night on a lonely street with nobody around. You now, some people can make decisions. Those of you that come to campus, our security personnel at campus actually will give uh, escorts, and a lot of colleges do that. Escorts, if you're going out at a certain time of night and you're, you're in fear that you might be attacked. Uh, there's a lot of things available to try to take away some of that, that routine. Uh, five objectives for situational crime prevention. I'm going to post a handout, which if you search this five objectives of situational crime prevention, you'll actually find it, but there's a, there's a grid, and it lists each of those five those five objectives, but then it lists potential ways to deal with it. So increase the effort involved in the crime, committing the crime is basically make it harder. Uh, concept of target hardening. You know, if you live in a house and you don't want people breaking into your house, you make sure that you have good deadbolt locks, you make sure that they're installed properly, you have locks on your windows, you have lighting around the house, all these things are making it more difficult. Increasing the risks. Those same things could increase the risk because it's going to take somebody more time to, to break in and it's more likely that, that they're going to get caught. Uh, reduce the awards. Don't leave your property in your car in plain view, which also then reduces the provocations. You know, rewards. When I worked in, in, in the department that I worked in, which is in the suburbs of New Jersey, we had all kinds of time where people would come into the community from wherever. They would drive into an apartment complex, they would drive into a neighborhood, and they would walk down the street, and they would look inside cars looking for stuff that was in plain view, whether it be a laptop, an iPod, whatever. You know, and all the electronics we have today, people leaving their cell phones in their cars, people leaving money in the car. Uh, one of the students in class last night said he had this happen to him. He left his polo jacket in his car, but he also left the door unlocked, and somebody went in and stole it. So, Reduce the rewards by not leaving your stuff in a position to get stolen. Reduce the provocations by not encouraging people by having stuff uh, available or making your house look like it's not occupied, you know, all those kind of things. And this grid that I'm going to post actually has all kinds of ideas for you. I spent a lot of time in my career involved in crime prevention programs and educating people, and these are the things, some of the things that I did. And remove excuses. You know, don't give the person excuses to, to commit the crime. You know, have rules, have instruction, maybe do things that will keep people away from dangerous areas. Seduction is a crime. There's a guy named Jack Katz in your book, page 29, basically said for some people that crime was like a sexual experience, that people got great pleasure, that, you know, you had this anticipation and then you had, you had the act, you know, and all the, the, what goes along with doing the act, and then just tremendous release once you were done, which he equated to, to sex. And he wrote a book with that premise. So for many people, it's rewarding. And certainly, in some sense, it's rewarding. You know, and I told my students in class the other night about this guy that I dealt with who was a juvenile when I first met him. He started stealing bicycles, and he got a, a kick out of that. And he used to take the bicycles, take them apart, rebuild them, paint them so they didn't look like what they were in the first place. But, you know, that wasn't enough. Then he would go into people's garages and take the bicycles because the bicycles initially he took were, you know, dumb kids leaving them sitting out on the sidewalk. But then he would go in the, in the open garages and steal stuff. If he didn't find any open garages, he started looking for open, unlocked doors and windows and, and going into houses that way, which is a burglary. And ultimately, when he started finding he couldn't find open doors and windows because people were being better security would actually break in. And he kept going up and up. I called him the stairs, my stair step guy. 
because he just kept climbing the stairs because it kept becoming more exciting, more money, whatever. And eventually he committed robbery, which got him two years in a, a, a training center because he was still a juvenile. And unfortunately, he's done a, a variety of things. He's in his 30s now, I believe. Uh, I haven't checked on, on him in a while. The last time I, I saw him was like 10 years ago. I think he was like 27 or 28. So he's probably in his in like late 30s now. And uh, he was still, at that time, at the age of 27, still committing crimes. Uh, but for many people, it's rewarding. You know, they get a kick out of it. It's fun. Situational crime prevention is basically what I said is you take that situation and you try to change the situation, right? Have people understand the situations that might lead to someone decide to commit a crime and then change that situation so that they don't commit the crime. Uh, physical, organizational, social environments, change the environment. And one prime example is target hardening. Like I said, deadbolt locks, locks on windows and doors. Some people in the city actually have bars on the win outside windows. You know, there's all kinds of, that's target hardening. It's making it harder to get into that target. So it takes longer. And when I was doing crime prevention, my goal was the person whose house I was visiting was telling them their goal was to make their house so hard to get into that the bad guy's going to go next door to their neighbor. My job was to train more people in my community to do the same thing so that the bad guy would go to another, another community. You know, people got to laugh out of that. It was like, I'm just trying to push the crime somewhere else, you know, reposition that crime or displacement is a, is a, is a theory. Uh, and I think it's mentioned in this chapter in your book, when you, when you do a lot of things in a particular area to stop crime, one of the side effects of doing that is something called displacement. So think about if you got this massive drug corner in your neighborhood where you got 12 guys standing on a corner selling all kinds of stuff and a narcotic squad comes in and cleans it all up and all these guys are gone and you got, you know, patrol vehicles sitting down the street all the time. Well, is that drug sales going to stop? Unless of course you keep them locked up. So maybe even if you keep those guys locked up, somebody else is going to pop up to do it, but where are they going to pop up? They're going to pop up two blocks down the street. That's displacement. So obviously from a police perspective, you got to do more than just hit that one area, uh, hardening that one target because you're going to have that crime pop up somewhere else. All right. So Moving right along, I said target hardening. I actually accidentally shared my screen. So we'll go back to this. Sorry. It's like being in the classroom, right? All right, now we will look at neoclassicism and punishment. Uh, well, let me go back for a second and talk about target hardening and talk about situational crime prevention. There is a concept that I would like you to look up. It's called SEPTED. SEPTED stands for Crime Prevention Through Environmental Design. Right, CPTED. CPTED. Basically, what SEPTED is about is building communities in a way that removes some of these situational issues. So you make it so the community, uh, so like from everybody's living room window, they can see everybody else's house. So that somebody, it's harder to break in because everybody's looking. You have lights in more appropriate places. Maybe you have. Uh, border walls, you know, like we want to do with Mexico. That's situational crime prevention, is, is changing the situation, making it harder to get through. Uh, but you might have a community like a, a, a gated community. You know, the situational crime prevention, SEPTED, is building the community, building the new mall, whatever, so that you, you think in the planning process for this place, how do I remove some of these potential issues? It's like taking out those lonely, dark, dead-end streets in, in some neighborhoods or in a mall, you know, no, no dead-end hallways, places where people could get uh, attacked with nobody around. You know, maybe locking off access to stairwells except for escape purposes. You know, there's all kinds of different things that could be done. SEPTED, very important principle. All right, moving right along. Uh, neoclassicism views uh, of punishment. Remember, we talked about deterrent earlier, and this is where we get into specific and general deterrence. But in both classical and neoclassical, we've said they believe that if you 
had the proper punishment that was just severe enough that people would decide not to commit crimes. So punishment is a deterrent. Punishment in neoclassical thought, in addition to being a deterrent, is also retribution. It's that payback. It is making a person get what they deserve. So neoclassical moved on a little bit in that we added that they should be paying for their crimes. And that from that, you got the concept of just desserts, part of our justice model. Criminal offenders deserve to be punished. Punishment should be appropriate to what crime they did. So you got a guy who is speeding 75 in a 50, you're not throwing him into prison for 30 days, right? Or the jail for 30 days. He gets a ticket that costs him a fine. And maybe he says, well, I don't want to lose that money again. You got to commit a person that commits a murder, you know, the, the punishment relevant to the crime, 30 years, life, death penalty. You get the concept. You know, the, the punishment needs to be somewhere at the same level of the crime and should be just above. So it costs me more to commit the crime than the value that I got out of doing the crime. Again, they deserve it. So deterrence, very important in neoclassical thought, is we want the sentence that's going to inhibit criminal behavior because the person fears punishment. Great idea. Great idea. Unfortunately, whether it's the mechanics of our system or the fact that people don't really think through the process too much doesn't necessarily work. So the mechanics of our system, remember they said swift, certain, and severe. Well, is our system swift? No. Is it certain? No. And we're going to see that in a moment. Is it severe? Maybe. So, but it depends. Some people get very light punishments for something that, that most pe other people think they should have got a lot more. And, and sometimes the punishment is, is thought to be too severe. Or too harsh. So I said the concept of deterrence is broken down as specific and general. Specific deterrence is taking the guy that committed the crime, guy or gal that commits the crime, and deterring them from doing it again. So if I got five years for committing the crime with a gun, after I come out, the idea of deterrence suggests that I'm going to be less likely. Now, we're going to see that recidivism, which means re people repeating crimes, is very high. So apparently that's not working too well. But that's a general idea. General deterrence is when the rest of the population sees that so-and-so got arrested and went to prison. That they're going to say, well, you know what? Johnny Jones got five years. I don't think I'm going to do that. Now, another part of our system, because it takes so long to get some of these people through the system, is generally there's not a whole lot of connection between the person doing the crime and, a, you know, maybe it shows up in the paper or it's on TV. You know, there's not a whole lot of connection between that and ultimately the trial and the punishment. Now, sometimes, you know, the media, when they play it up a lot at the end, then people are, oh, wow, that, that happened. But it was like, it happened two years ago, and now the guy's getting tried for the, for the case. You know, I'm following a trial right now in, in – uh, Superior Court in Camden, New Jersey, with this guy who's being tried for killing his, his young son. You know, that was two years ago when it happened. He's just being tried now. You know, that's a big case. It's in the, it's in the paper every day. It's on the news every day. So maybe that could have some deterrent. But if, you know, if somebody's committing a murder, I still don't believe that there's a lot of people that are really deterred. You know, some maybe higher thinking folks who, you know, who, who might plan something are going to, not do it, but some of the stuff that happens on the street, street robbery, street crime, whatever, there's not a whole lot of thought that goes into that all the time. So, again, swift, certain, and severe. That's the idea. I did, punishments should prevent repetition of the crime. Uh, recidivism, like I said, is, is someone repeating criminal behavior. Generally, when we count recidivism and we're looking at recidivism rates, we're looking at people that committed a new crime within five years of release from the prison. So, you know, you, you go in for robbery, you get out, 
and two years later you, you burglarize somebody's house, you're considered a recidivist. If you get out and like 10 years later you do something, you're probably not gonna get counted as a recidivist. All right, recidivism rate's pretty high, 80 to 90%. And again, part of the problem is it takes, it takes so long for it to happen, but also the punishment doesn't happen to a lot of people. So people can look at it and say, well, yeah, there's all this stuff going on, but people aren't getting caught. And if you look at this, this is an example, and this is in your book, you can, you can pour over it, and of course you have the slideshow, and look and say, okay, we have approximately, and it's an estimate, because nobody really knows, obviously, because that, that dark figure of crime that we talked about last week, so we have 38 million, an estimate of 38 million, and this is probably based upon an extrapolation of, of NCVS data that says, hey, we think there's about 38 million uh, felonies committed annually. Well, how many of them are getting reported? Look at the next level, 10.3 million. That's, that's less than a third, right? Less than 30% of crimes are actually being reported. And then look at the number of people that are arrested. 3.8 million, that's only one-tenth, or 10% of the ones that are committed. And then the people that are getting actually convicted, when they go to trial and get convicted, it's only 1.1 million. So that's even less. That's like less than half a percent of the, you got 38 million, and then you have 1.1 million that are, are convicted. It's less than half a percent of the people. And then who gets sent to prison? Only like 700,000 of those 1.1 million that get convicted, say two thirds, a little over two thirds of them are going to prison, right? Two thirds, three quarters going to prison. Uh, so of course, a lot of people, depending upon what the crime is, you have community corrections, people getting probation, so maybe that's why they're not going, or maybe you have a judge who just decides not to sentence them. But this is an example. You know, people can say, well, yeah, you know, there's punishment available, but you know what? Most people don't get caught. And therefore, deterrence doesn't always work. And we start looking at the death penalty. Again, we start looking at deterrence, look at retribution, just desserts. All of these come together when we talk about capital punishment. You know, we think that if, if we're going to kill somebody, going to take somebody's life when they take somebody else's life, that that's going to prevent them from doing it. Or if we know, yeah, you know, we know that somebody's going to, uh, we're going to lose my life if I kill somebody, great. Clearly, the person who gets the death penalty and gets executed, they're not killing anybody else. So that specific deterrent, yeah, that exists. You know, Joey Jones decides he doesn't like his friend Johnny. He kills Johnny, he gets a death penalty, he gets executed, lethal injection. He ain't killing nobody else. That specific deterrent works. But is, you know, Charlie, who lives in the same neighborhood or the same city, when he hears that Joey, you know, that got executed for killing Johnny, is that going to, is he going to think about that if he gets into an altercation with, with Sam? Is that going to prevent him from pulling a gun and shooting Sam? Probably not. And there's lots of studies that suggest that that general deterrence with regard to uh, the death penalty is not there. Uh, retribution is, you know, some people feel that you take a life, you should give your life. That's retribution. Just desserts is the same thing. Is the, it, you commit that crime, that's what you deserve. Now, there's a lot of debate about this issue, which is why only 31 of our 50 states now have the death penalty. Uh, I will post, well, I posted a link to the Death Penalty Information Center in the webliography. If you go there, there's a lot of information about the death penalty. A couple of the charts are actually reproduced within your book as far as the number of people that, that receive the death penalty based upon race. There's, there's also some issues uh, that people claim with regard to a racial inequity with regard to the death penalty. As you have 35% of the people that, that are executed in the United States between 70, 1976 and 2013, 35% were black, 50% were white, 7% were Latino, and 2% were whatever else is left, other people. Uh, and you say, okay, well, 56% were white. A lot more white people got the death penalty than black people. At the same time, 
black people only make up 13% of our population. So you have some folks that say, well, why, if it's only 13% of the population or 35% winding up on death row? Another factor that's not considered when people throw that out there is what percentage of white, black, Latino, and whatever are actually committing crimes that rate the death penalty. Some folks are saying that uh, prosecutors are more likely to go after the death penalty if it's a black uh, black defendant with a white victim. And there's a lot of, you can read that on the Death Penalty Information Center, a lot of, a lot of debate, again, about that. And this, this is just, where'd it go? There was a list. Uh, I thought there was a list. Let me go back and make sure I didn't miss it. Because you have abolitionists and advocates. So yeah, abolitionists are people that want to get rid of the death penalty, and advocates are those who, who want to maintain it. I thought there was supposed to be a, a list on this slide, but it's not showing up. But this is some of the things, and it's just a list. They say capital punishment does not deter crime, and there's a lot of data that actually supports that. Uh, death penalty has at times been imposed on innocent people. We've heard of that now. The, the, uh, the Innocence Project has helped get a lot of people exonerated based upon DNA evidence and other things uh, who might have been executed. But there's also cases of people that actually were executed who we later on found out that they didn't commit the crime. So people who want to get rid of it say, hey, it's too much of a risk. If it's possible that this person was not guilty and we take their life, we just killed an innocent person. And some people say that it doesn't matter what they did, human life is sacred and the state should not be involved in taking it. Basically, extension of that is they say that we become the same moral level as a murderer. Uh, also, it's not been imposed properly. It's been imposed unevenly, randomly, disproportionately among minorities, which I already explained. Uh, capital punishment goes against fundamental concept of organized religion. So most religions don't believe you should be killing people. And of course, it's very expensive. Now, this is an interesting. Abolitionists want to get rid of the death penalty because it's more expensive than imprisonment. The main reason why the death penalty is much more expensive is because of all the appeals, because of the court time, and also because a lot of times these people are kept in a special wing of the prison system and maybe it costs a little bit more to house them. I believe in, in Pennsylvania, I saw a number a few years back that it's like $30,000 a year to house a regular prisoner and 40,000 to house a death penalty prisoner. But then the other costs are trial after trial, or appeal after appeal after appeal, which is why you have people who are on death row who may have been there for 30 years. Example, you can look up deathpenalty.org, but you can also go to PA, uh, I think it's PA Corrections website if you look it up, and it'll show you how many people are on death row in Pennsylvania, and it'll show you how long they've been there. Pennsylvania has not executed anyone since like 1998 or 1999 when Gary Heidnick was killed. And we're going to talk about Gary Heidnick when we get to psychological and psychiatric issues. And a little uh, preview is we actually have in our class a retired police officer who was one of the first officers that was in contact with Gary Heidnick when he was arrested for his murders many years ago. In the, it was like 1988 when he was arrested, I believe. But Gary Heidnick was the last person to be executed in the state of Pennsylvania. And right now we have a moratorium in the state of Pennsylvania instituted by a current Governor Wolf until the, uh, the state legislature can properly study it and determine whether we need, meet, need to make changes to the statute. So effectively, nobody's getting the death penalty in Pennsylvania. So even if Larry Krasner, who's running for DA, in Philadelphia says, I'm never going to use a death penalty. Even if he did, it hasn't been implemented you know, over the last so many years. Like I said, 1998, where are we at? 2017. Internationally, abolitionists say, well, capital punishment is, is not viewed nicely in most countries around the world. Matter of fact, issues in Philadelphia years ago, there was a, a guy who was wanted for a murder of a young woman in Philadelphia a long time. He fled to France and uh, 
previous DA, Lynn Abraham, was one of the people involved in trying to get him back. And France would not agree to let to send him back, would not agree to extradition because of the fact that Pennsylvania had the death penalty. So in order to get him back, the DA would have to agree to uh, not go for the death penalty. His name was Ira Einhorn, if you want to look up that case. Unfortunately, uh, sadly, I, I can't off the top of my head remember the victim's name, but this was a, a young woman who he killed and then he put her in like a, a box or a case in a closet and eventually she was found and then he, he fled. He took off. And we couldn't get him back from France because we had a death penalty and they didn't believe in it. So that's another issue. Uh, and certainly folks that say that want to get rid of death penalty say, hey, we have an alternative. Just lock them up forever. Lock them up till they die. Never let them out. People who believe in capital punishment basically say they deserve it. Somebody kills somebody, they deserve to die. Again, we already talked about the uh, potential imbalance, the disproportionate application. And look up deathpenalty.org. Look at the charts that are here in your book. Uh, about 50% are from minorities. So you look at the chart of the people that, that received the death penalty uh, from 76 to 2013. You have 56% white and the rest are minorities. So say 56% white would be 44% uh, all the rest. Here in this, this slide differs a little bit from the book because it says about 50%. It's according to the chart of those that got killed before that was, it would have been 46. Your book doesn't say uh, how many are currently. But if you go to deathpenalty.org, it actually breaks that out. And I did give out in class last night the handout from the deathpenalty.org, but it's readily available on their website if you want to take a look at it. All right, how do we decrease the flaws in the death penalty? Well, that's a, that's a question for you to think about. A lot of people increase increase the use of scientific evidence, uh, lessen the use of, of eyewitness testimony, or give proper instruction to to uh, juries with regard to eyewitness testimony. Make sure that eyewitness testimony is is properly corroborated with other evidence. You know, all these kind of things. How do we decrease the flaws? We want to make sure that it's a slam dunk case, that there's no chance that this person is, is innocent. Now, considering that our, our legal system is beyond a reasonable doubt, there's always going to be a chance for a flaw because most criminal cases are not totally obvious. You don't always have all that sealed, you know, you know signed, sealed, and delivered forensic evidence. But as our technology gets better, as our forensic people get better, all kinds of things, it's more likely that we're going to have that evidence in cases, especially with, with video everywhere. There's all kinds of stuff. But if you look at this case I'm following right now, the guy's name is G -D DJ Creato. His son was Brendan Creato. The medical examiner can't even tell you how the kid died, believes he was possibly suffocated, but they're not sure. Nobody, there's no witnesses that saw this guy kill the kid. There's no witnesses that saw this guy take his kid out of the house. There's no evidence tying him to the murder of the kid. There was no visible injuries to show that what happened to the kid, no, no evidence in the home. And yet there's a potential that this guy is going to get convicted of a murder. Now, if you read through the entire case, you might say, well, sure he did. He was alone, sleeping with his kid in the house and the kid somehow got out of the house, winds up being found by a local body of water, partially in the water and deceased. Forensic evidence, testimony from detectives and the medical examiner said there was no dirt. The kid was wearing socks. There was no dirt in the socks that they felt there was no way the kid could have got from the house to where he was found without getting the socks dirty. So, at the very least, they suggested that he was carried to the location where he was found. So there's a lot of things that might say, yeah, that guy did it. But it's really not, there's no slam dunk. So people have to say, okay, this guy was in the house. 
the house was locked. Somehow this kid, this little kid got out of this locked house and went up dead by the creek and he didn't walk there. So people were putting that together and say, yeah, maybe dad killed him. But I would, I don't know that I could decide to, to convict this guy in that case, but we're going to see maybe later today whether, whether the jury decides otherwise. And he, well, New Jersey doesn't have a death penalty, so he doesn't have to worry about that. So that's the other thing about, you know, if you take away the death penalty and somebody gets wrongfully convicted, at least later on, like there's this guy in Philadelphia that is in the newspaper whose name I didn't bring the paper up with me, but it was in yesterday's inquiry and Sunday's inquiry where the guy was in incarcerated for 24 years and they were just able to clear him. Uh, so at least if, the, if, if you don't get the death penalty, there's always a potential that if you were long, wrongfully uh, convicted that you could, uh, evidence should show up later and you can get out. All right. Policy. What's classical school do about policy? Like I said, most of our, our criminal justice system is based upon classical school. So determinative setting, sentencing is the idea that people get a fixed term. So this is like the punishment fits the crime. Everybody commits a burglary gets the same. Everybody commits rape gets the same. Everybody commits murder gets the same. That's determinate sentencing. Our system is necessarily worked that way everywhere today, but that's what that concept is. Uh, builds upon pleasure versus uh, pain. Fixed amount is that deterrent. So if I, I know that if I commit a certain crime, this is what I'm going to get. It's provides that certainty. The determinant sentencing provides that certainty. Where if you have a system where there's a range from five to 10, I know, well, maybe I'll get five, maybe I'll get 10. If I know I'm gonna get 10, am I gonna be less likely to commit the crime? That's the idea. Truth in sentencing is rules in, in many states that require that when the judge does the sentence, that they actually have to publish how long the person is likely to stay in. So this also, goes back to deterrent. So if when when a guy gets sentenced, guy or gal, because girls commit crimes too, but men commit more crimes than women. We know that for sure. Uh, that We don't have the data sitting in front of us, but many more men in prison than women. But when they get sentenced, truth in sentencing tells us that, yes, absolute minimum that person's going to serve is this much. So everybody knows how much time they're going to serve. So that provides victims with some, some consolation or some uh, feeling that they know this person's gonna be away for a while, but it also tells the rest of the world, this is how long that you get, you get for doing this. And also truth in sentencing laws require that they serve a large portion of their sentence, at least 80% in most cases, before they can get out. Incapacitation, mentioned this already, is when we use prison imprisonment to keep somebody from committing more crimes. So we're locking them up. We know that that person is not going to be out there hurting people for, for that many years. Death penalty is also a form of incapacitation. When we, you know, when we kill the murderer, we know they're not killing anybody else. Because you say, well, you could lock him up for life. He's not going to kill anybody else either. There's actually a case in Pennsylvania a few years ago where you had two people that were in prison for murder and one killed the other one. So the guy can, you know, committed a second murder while he was locked up. Uh, selective incapacitation is when we're, we uh, imprison of specific individuals. Collective is when we change legislation or sentencing patterns, we lead to removing dangerous individuals from society. So similar, but one is talking about specific people and the other is, 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 is more group oriented. All right. Evaluations, we talked about some of this already. Critiques, some place, some people say that, you know, we can say that people make rational choices, but it really doesn't explain their motivation. So there's really not explanations of how a choice for or against a criminal activity is made. Why does one person decide to do the crime while someone else may decide not to in the same circumstance? Uh, don't have idea of what's deeply inside people that commit their uh, their motivation. And of course, there's, there's not research. Classical or neoclassical doesn't have a whole lot of research going on. Uh, 
there's some more today. The original, the original classical theory, there really wasn't any research. Uh, now, neoclassical and everybody's researching stuff today. So there's going to be some studies that try to tie this in. But again, everything should be integrated now. Uh, neoclassical, suggestion that maybe neoclassical isn't that great because you have some communities where uh, they didn't have the get tough policies that could have come out of, of neoclassical and they still had reductions in crime. Uh, little, scientif little scientific progress, so there's still not a whole lot, but I'd say there's, there's some. Overemphasizing importance of choice with regard without a lot of regard for the social forces involved So there's people that say yeah people make choices, but you know what there's a whole lot of other stuff going on and Some people say neoclassical isn't really a valid theory because most of the things that influence people commit crimes are beyond their control Again really today what we are is integrated Ultimately people do make a choice, but what we need to know is what influenced them to make that choice What do you think is the most uh, relevant criticism of either one? Why? Think about that. Chapter summary, this just goes over everything that we already did. You can read through it. Uh, don't know that, that I need to do that right now. So take your time as you, you know, work through this. Uh, you should have the slide deck available to you. You also have uh, chapter, end of chapter questions that you can look at to, to help you and of course our assignments for the week, the discussion questions and the weekly assignment should help to cement some of this material. Uh, there's also a case study at the end of the chapter on a guy named Gary uh, Stephen Christ, which is very interesting. You should probably read that. And of course, after the case study, you have questions that are related to the various principles that we discussed throughout uh, this uh, lecture. Nothing works. Punishment is deterrent. Death penalty. Again, we talked about all that, what the advocates suggest and what the uh, opponents suggest as well. We've had a lot of changes over the last 30 years or so. Still a lot of people believe strongly in classical thought. They're still, uh, but again, integrated. I've been a firm believer that people ultimately make decisions but I will also acknowledge that those decisions sometimes are, are forced based upon things beyond a person's control. Story I told last night to class, uh, a guy who lived in Mount Laurel by the name of Albert Jump. He uh, lived in a nice single family home with his family. He, he and his wife, both Philadelphia teachers. And uh, apparently they were having some trouble, I believe, with their mortgage. This is all, there's actually newspaper articles to verify all this. You want to look it up. Uh, I looked it up, I think, a year ago before. I haven't looked it up recently. But it's all out there if you use that name. Anyway, he goes and robs the bank. He robs a bank. Well, the bank that he robbed was the bank that he did business with. You're thinking, wow, this guy had a, accounts at this bank. He went into bank. Uh, but he made the, and he made the choice to do that. He made the choice to go into this particular bank wearing some kind of mask to hide his face and rob the bank. Now, of course, he was a regular customer in the bank, so they, his body type, the way he walked, the way he talked, were all familiar to the te bank teller, which is what obviously she told us when after after the bank robbery took place. You know, she explained why well, that guy he was familiar. So the investigation basically, they found out that like the next day, he went to another branch of the same bank and made a deposit in his account. So they found out the same amount of money that was stolen from the bank wound up in this guy's account. And he's a regular customer of the bank where he stole the money from. Why? You say free will, he made a choice throughout the bank, but why? Because he was in a severe economic situation fearful of losing his home, thought, hey, I need the money so I can at least get another month on my mortgage so I don't lose the house. What happened instead, he spends like five, I think it was five years in federal prison for bank robbery. Uh, good side of it is I don't believe they lost the house because I was working a case later on, several years later, and I, you know, knocking on doors and talking to various people 
about a burglary that happened across the street, and I talked to his son. So I know they were still living there. Somehow they managed, even even though he got locked up for the robbery, spent five years in prison, they still managed to, to dig out somehow out of the financial crisis. But he made the choice based upon what he perceived as a serious issue. So I think that's a good example of how you know you have somebody making a free will choice, but he was seriously impacted by the economic issues of his family. So let's stop sharing. So again, if you have any questions with regard to this material, don't hesitate. Uh, we have lots of options. You have the discussion groups. You'll be discussing with each other about what, what was talked about today. Uh, a lot of answers inside the chapter itself, but you can reach out to me through the, uh, the Dropbox or through text messaging or through email. There's a, there is actually the ability to reply right underneath this video. And you can ask specific questions about the lecture if you want, and I will answer them, and then everybody will get to see what they are. And that's good. Obviously, if you're in a classroom and somebody asks a question and the teacher answers the question, then everybody gets the answer. If you send me a text message and I answer the question, nobody knows but you. So if you have a question relevant to the material, it's probably better to answer it, to ask it in some kind of public forum, like the discussion group or like the uh, the spot that's underneath it here, so that everybody else in the class can see what your uh, what your question was and what the answer was. So, hope everybody's doing well. Again, reach out to me if you need to, either by phone, by email, by the Dropbox, whatever, in the discussion groups, and uh, hopefully we're all going to be successful. Y'all have a great day.